So here's the big question. Based on the last 18 months, would I buy this car again? Hmm. Hi folks, welcome back to the channel and today I can hardly believe it but it's been 18 months and almost 13,000 miles since we picked up our Tesla Model 3 from the Trafford Centre in Manchester. And if you've been following the channel you'll know we've been up to all sorts in that time, big road trips, adding all kinds of accessories and we've really tested the limits of this as our sole family car. So if you've already seen my six month review, don't worry I'm not going to be covering any old ground here and in fact I want to approach this video entirely differently. If you missed that one though feel free to hit pause, click up here and check it out before coming back to this video. I promise I won't hold it against you. So in this long-term ownership review, we're gonna be looking at my latest thoughts on the good, the bad, and I'll finish off with an honest answer to the question, after 18 months, would I buy this car again? Let's get into it. Before I get into this part, it's worth noting, I started writing this video as my 12 month review and in the end I didn't get to post it because we had such dreadful weather in our September last year, I simply couldn't get out to shoot any decent B-roll of the car. And I'd noted a few things in the bad column which have subsequently been sorted out in software updates. And for me, this is one of the best things about owning this car. The car that you drive away on the day you pick up is gonna be measurably better by the time you sell it on or you hand it back thanks to free, regular, over the air software updates that you can choose to install when your car is parked at home and you're asleep. Now in the last six months, we've had Apple Music get added as a streaming option, sat nav updates galore, including a helpful option to choose your route rather than set a fixed one, and the option to add in swipeable cars underneath the car's driving screen. Now, when I think about our previous car having to go into the dealership garage for several days to have basic updates applied, I can't imagine ever going back to that. Another big positive when it comes to owning this car has been the cost. I'm not gonna go into as much detail as I did with my six month review, but suffice to say our total charging costs over 18 months have been about 600 pounds. Now you don't need to be a mathematical guru to know that this is substantially less than I would have paid in fuel, although because I have this cool little stats app called Tezzy, I can actually tell you that in the last 18 months, I would have spent over 3,000 pounds to do the equivalent mileage at the current rates, likely more given the various fuel crises we've seen in recent years. So in terms of other costs, there have been maintenance, which has been all but non-existent. I've bought some wheel covers to address the alloy damage, a bit more up here if you wanna see what we did, and filled up the screen wash a few times, but honestly, that's about it. Now compared to the maintenance costs of our previous ICE car, which was a big family diesel SUV, all in we would have spent at least five times more over a similar time frame. Now in my six month review, we talked about how awesome autopilot is. And I stand by that, particularly for motorway cruising at night when there's not much traffic about. Although I've come to mainly use the intelligent cruise control for most motorway trips. Setting the speed and distance and then having the ability to switch lanes at will is for me much easier than having to disconnect autopilot before moving about on the road. And this next one is just a general point about EV ownership. I do wanna talk a little later about what differences I found in being an EV owner now compared to when we started with this car, but it really isn't any hardship owning an electric vehicle. And that comes with a big caveat. If you have got a home charger installed, people often ask me what it's like to have to charge a car, imagining that you might need to charge maybe every 50 miles or so, but this thing has got a quoted 360 mile range. And the reality of that based on our testing is more like a full battery will give you about 320 miles, which is absolutely fine for 99% of trips you'll make. And you might also ask, what if you can't find a charging station and you get stuck? Well, the reality is if you're out and about and you need a quick charge, if it's in an emergency and you've got a three pin charger with you, you're likely to be able to find an electric point before you come across a petrol station in most places you go to so you're actually better off if that's any concern so let's move on to the bad then after 18 months it's fair to say the appeal and the sheen of a new car plus the transition to ev ownership has definitely worn off and i can keep things objective when it comes to really examining what we don't much like about this car now, first of all, after a year, we lost the ability to have free access to the premium connectivity services, which basically gives you things like live traffic alerts on your sat nav, video streaming for the likes of YouTube, Netflix, and Disney Plus, and also music streaming for Spotify, Apple Music, and generally all internet connectivity. After a year, you get downgraded to the basic connectivity options. And let's be fair, you know, these are all pretty good to be included as standard, especially those software upgrades, but you will need to pay $9.99 a month in order to get the other stuff. 
Now I know Tesla aren't alone in sucking customers into a subscription package for this type of thing, but I do think it's a bit cheeky for at least two reasons. Firstly, that cellular connectivity is so slow. I'm used to accessing content on my phone and tablet at 5G speeds, and by contrast, this feels like you're going at a snail's pace to even load up like a 720p quality YouTube video. It's just not good enough. Secondly, there is the ability to hotspot from your phone and essentially use your mobile as a wireless access point, so you theoretically didn't need to pay the 999 and get much faster speeds but Tesla do not make this easy. For example, you'd have to join the hotspot every time you got in the car, as opposed to it being something the car automatically joins, and then even then you're locked out of things like the live traffic alerts, which are really helpful. So this friction in the process is just hassle enough not to bother. Also, there is the cost. If I wanted to buy a SIM card with 5G speeds, it wouldn't take much shopping around to get a price better than 9.99 a month. And if I wanted like for like with a kind of LTE, 3G connection, you'd be at a fraction of this cost. And on a connected note, the interface is something that will take some adapting to if you're coming from a non-Tesla car. There are things about it that are great. Big maps, semi-customizable screens, etc. But sometimes a lot of it just isn't that intuitive. And in some cases, it's just downright dangerous. Let's take turning on my fog lights, for example. Now, in a non-Tesla car, there's usually a little dial on the indicator stalks or maybe somewhere on the dashboard that you press or turn and then you're good. Here, I've got to look down from the road at the screen, find the settings menu, this opens up in an area of the screen that is about as far away from me as it could be. Then I've got to look at these options and then decide which of my fog lights need turning on. That is a lot of steps to go through with a lot of room for you to have not been looking at the road for a long time. This is fine if you're cruising along in autopilot, but in almost all driving scenarios, that's not most people. And you can't do this with voice control either. So again, a lot of friction from the user experience perspective. Another example, the Spotify app. So let's say I search for a song, play it, and then I want to go back to my searches because I want to find other music by that artist or more from the album. No, can't do it. I need to run the whole search again, and then I have to go into album this time rather than the song. Now you're probably watching this shouting, first world problems, Mark, and I get that but this is so clunky that it just drives me around the bend. And it just doesn't need to be this hard if you look at how the iOS apps work, as an example. Next up, the classic bum door opening. Let me tell you what I mean. So a great thing about this car is that you don't need a key. They give you some key cards, but no one really uses those. You basically link your phone to your Tesla profile driving account, and then whenever you leave the car, it locks itself. And whenever you approach the car and open the doors, it unlocks. Theoretically, now in practice, I have found that this only works in very specific situations. So for example, your phone needs to be as close to the car as possible. Now that usually means front trouser pocket. Anything else, and you will have to go through a little bit of trial and error in order to get the door to open. If like me, you often keep your phone somewhere else, maybe in a bag or a coat or a back pocket, you'll often have to press yourself up against the car for the Bluetooth connection to register. So as a result, I often find myself attempting to open the car, failing, and then having to kind of turn around and open it whilst facing away from the car like a cheeky thief. Hence the bum door opening. Next up, and this isn't Tesla's fault, but it is significant. The insurance costs have increased pretty considerably into year two of ownership. So our first year was 514 pounds, and the following year our renewal rocketed up to 758 pounds with the same provider. The best renewal quote we could find this time around was 621 pounds. Apparently this is to do with the time it takes to repair EVs and also the cost of things like replacement batteries and other parts. So yeah, coming from a history where the older a car gets, the less it costs to insure, assuming no accidents, this was a bit disappointing. There's another thing that isn't really Tesla's fault, but more a downside of EV ownership that I've noticed, is that the costs of public charging are really increasing quite a bit. Now, in our first year of ownership, we not only had some lovely free supercharger miles to use up, but we also had a range of complementary charging points around our city that were easy to access. Now I've noticed that slowly those free charging points have turned into charged for sites, which is both understandable, but also a bit of a shame if the agenda is to get people happy with electric vehicle adoption. So the reality for us is that we now very rarely charge away from our house because we had a home charger fitted, and thankfully we do have a decent rate with our energy provider. Certainly much better than we'd pay at any of these public charging points. But just recently we were away from home staying with my in-laws and I realised I did need a quick top up. So a check on ZapMap found that there were a few to choose from, including a fast CC charger just down the road. So I plugged in and added 30% onto the battery, which is the equivalent of about 100 miles of range, and it was pretty speedy. It took no more than 20 minutes. 
But here's the thing, the price for that charge was actually more than I would have paid had I put the equivalent mileage into a petrol car. So this was the first time I'd ever seen this since switching to an EV and I think we're now getting to that point where we will soon see petrol and electricity reaching parity and that will probably be the price we pay for the convenience of being able to access these fast, reliable chargers such as this one from Instavolt. So like I promised, I'm gonna answer this question. After 18 months of ownership, would I buy a Tesla Model 3 again? And before I answer this, here comes my psychology hat. My cognitive bias, specifically my sunk cost fallacy, is telling me that I should probably say yes because I've already committed to the cost of this car, both the upfront deposit and all the lease payments to date and all the accessories we've added. But do you know what? I'm gonna go against this and say no. I wouldn't buy this car again. And the operative word in this sentence is this. So why not this car? Well, let's start with a paint job. I really wish I'd held my ground on the colour so we'd have ended up with the colour we originally ordered rather than settling for a different paint job in order to get the car on time. Now, if you missed what happened there, I do talk about this in my collection video, it's just up there. But honestly, the black paintwork is probably the worst of the bunch and I should have known. I've had black cars before and whilst they look incredible clean, they show up every speck of dirt when they're not. Now, the black paintwork is also more likely to show up minor scratches due to it not being multi-coat like the other colours. So if you are wanting this colour, maybe consider something like PPF wrapping or even ceramic coating in order to keep things looking good. Moving on to the model, when it came time to buy this car, I was aware that the Model Y was on its way to the UK, but without a definite availability date and my lease rapidly running out on our previous car, I kind of had to bite the bullet and go for the Model 3. And part of me just wishes I'd waited, maybe got a little higher car to tie this over for a bit and gone with the Model Y instead and had all those benefits of additional height, space, and that lovely big hatchback boot which this car offers. And as a family of four, we have adjusted to the storage and space that you get with a saloon like the Model 3, but a hatchback would have made life just a little bit easier. Now, please don't get me wrong, if you've ordered a Tesla Model 3 and this is making you worry, you needn't be too concerned. Despite all I've said, this is a brilliant car. It's probably the most fun car to drive and one of the cheapest cars to run that I've ever owned in all my years of driving. And the overwhelming feeling 18 months on is just how much the EV market has grown here in the UK. When I placed our order for this car back in mid-2021, there really weren't that many viable alternatives to Tesla available, but we are now seeing huge amounts of increased competition from other car manufacturers, and I think that's a great thing. I'm genuinely excited by the idea that my next car will definitely be electric, but it might not be a Tesla. Now, Tesla have had a huge head start on the market for purpose-built EVs, but unfortunately, they have allowed other car manufacturers to catch up, and Tesla are losing some of those competitive advantages. Now that those other car manufacturers are cottoning on that actually it's not such a great idea just to retrofit existing ICE cars as electric vehicles, it's actually much easier to design them that way from the start. And of course, last year we saw Tesla start to unlock their supercharging network to be available to other EV brands, and there goes another USP of being a Tesla owner. We are living in really interesting times and I can't wait to see what both Tesla and their competitors come up with next. So I'm really interested to know your thoughts on all of this. I know some of my viewers are either aspirational Model 3 owners or already drive a Tesla. Would you buy yours again if you had the choice or would you perhaps get something else? Let me know in the comments down below and make sure you add the word supercharged so I know you made it this far in the video. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed this one. It's been a while in the making. If you did, be kind, hit the like button as it really does help the channel out. And if you'd like to see more like this, maybe even a cheeky subscribe. See you next time.